Welcome to this educational activity, a new dawn in the therapeutic management of biliary tract cancers, integrating precision medicine with new and emerging targeted strategies. My name is Dr. Milan Javle from MD Anderson Cancer Center. In this educational activity, I will be highlighting the latest developments in the therapeutic management of biliary cancer, including the most recent data presented at the 2021 ASCO GI meeting. I will also discuss how I apply the latest evidence to practice through utilization of newly approved and guideline recommended therapies and via clinical trials with the ultimate goal of enhancing personalized care for patients with biliary tract cancers. Biliary cancers are heterogeneous. 90% of biliary tract cancers are adenocarcinoma. There is level one evidence for adjuvant therapy after surgery with capecitabine. Chemotherapy is largely palliative in intent, and in the first, time, first line includes gemcitabine and cisplatin, and in the second line, Falfox was shown to have an improved survival as compared with active symptom control. The median overall survival with these therapies is, however, less than 12 months, so this is an area of great unmet need and novel treatments are necessary. So gallbladder cancer, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma are grouped as one entity, whereas they're actually quite diverse. Gallbladder cancer is more common in females as compared with males. The risk factors include gallstones and polyps. Uh, these tumors may be also associated with infections such as salmonella typhi. Uh, they can be associated with obesity and diabetes. They typically present a, as an incidental finding following cholecystectomy in the Western world with or without abdominal pain. Extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, sometimes called as clad skin tumor, is the most common form of cholangiocarcinoma. It's more commonly seen in males as compared with females. And the risk factors include PSC, uh, Lynch syndrome, liver fluke infection, and it typically presents with obstructive jaundice. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is rapidly increasing in incidence, however. Uh, the risk factors for this type of cholangiocarcinoma include PSC, cirrhosis, uh, liver fluke infection, chronic hep B, alcohol, obesity. It can typically present it as an incidental finding during imaging. And it can be also considered for liver directed treatment, for instance, radiation therapy and radioembolization for those cases that are not surgically resectable. The incidence of mutations or genetic alterations differs between these three biliary tract cancer types. So in the, in the figure here, you see intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and gallbladder cancer have different set of genetic mutations. The most common genetic alterations, particularly intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, include FGFR uh, genetic alterations, which are fusions, mutations, or amplifications, and IDH1 or 2 substitutions. Both of these are more common in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and we will discuss these in the subsequent slides. The first is IDH alteration in cancer cells. IDH, or isocitrate de dehydrogenase, catalyzes the conversion of isocitrate to alpha ketoglucarate. In the presence of mutated IDH, we have an accumulation of the metabolite 2-hydroxyglucarate. 2-hydroxyglucarate is mutagenic, and it leads to epigenetic changes, gene expression changes, However, how this process predisposes to cancer and specific cancer types is still not known, but this is clearly represented an active area of investigation and it represents a therapeutic target. The phase three clarity trial investigated the IDH1 inhibitor evocindib versus placebo in the second line setting after prior gemcitabine and cisplatin. So adults, with a good performance status who had received one or two prior therapies and had measurable disease were enrolled on this trial. This trial had two arms. The treatment arm consists of evocidinib 500 milligrams once daily administered continuously in 28 day cycles. The other arm was placebo and there was a crossover allowed in this trial with the primary objective of the trial being progression free survival. As you can see in this figure, the progression free survival 
was significantly higher with evocidinib as compared with placebo. This also translated to an improvement in a disease control rate in, with evocidinib as compared with placebo. In the ASCO GI 2021 meeting, the final analysis of overall survival from this trial was presented. Analysis of overall survival in this, in this trial was complicated by the fact that patients treated on the placebo arm were allowed to cross over to the treatment arm. But using a statistical modeling called the rank preserving structural failure time method, which removed the noise that was created by this type of uh, crossover, uh, the investigator showed that there was in fact an overall survival improvement with the evocidinib as compared with placebo. And this also included an improvement in a six month survival rate and a 12 month survival rate. So this, this agent we hope will be approved by the FDA. Less than half the patients experienced grade three or more treatment related adverse events in either arm. The most common uh, toxicity being noted was ascites. In fact, this may have been related to the underlying disease. Treatment related adverse events leading to discontinuation were more common with placebo than with evocidinib. Again, this, this indicating that this agent is very well tolerated. Treatment related dose interruptions and reductions were however more common with evocidinib than placebo. The common toxicities noted were nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, and cough. Subscales corresponding to physical functioning, pain and appetite loss were pre-specified in the statistical analysis plan. P-values were not adjusted for a multiplicity. Evocidinib preserved the quality of life as measured by QLQC30 in the physical functioning scale, whereas placebo patients experienced decline. Similarly, evocidinib favored QLQC30 pain subscale, uh, especially up to cycle two. Neither arm was favored on other pre-specified subscales, such as appetite loss, uh, eating, and pain. FGFR genetic alterations are among the most common genetic aberrations that are seen in solid tumors. There are several mechanisms for FGFR signaling. FGFR pathway can be activated by protein overexpression, by activating mut mutations, oncogenic fusions, autocrine or paracrine mechanisms, deregulation of FGFR binding proteins. All of these pathways then lead to downstream activation, leading to cellular proliferation and resistance to ap apoptosis. The phase two phyte 202 trial uh, investigated the role of pemigatinib in locally advanced or metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. Adults with advanced cholangiocarcinoma who had received prior chemotherapy with gemcitabine and cisplatin had good performance status and had genetic profiling to investigate their FGFR status were included. This trial had three cohorts. Cohort A included 100 patients with FGFR fusions or rearrangements. Cohort B included 20 patients with other FGF or FGFR genetic alterations other than FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements. And cohort C included 20 patients who had no FGF or FGFR genetic alterations. In cohort A, a response rate noted was 35%, which included 3% complete responses. The duration of response was 7.5 months and the disease control rate was 82%. No responses were however noted in uh, the cohorts with other FGF or FGFR genetic alterations other than FGFR2 or those that had no FGF or FGFR genetic alterations. This figure reflects the progression-free survival with pemigatinib on the phyte 202 trial. In cohort A, which was FGFR2 fusions or rearrangements, the progression-free survival was 6.9 months. Cohort B, with other FGFR mutations, the progression-free survival was 2.1 months. And in cohort C, where there were no FGFR genetic alterations, the progression-free survival was 1.7 months. The promising results in cohort A led to the FDA approval in April 2020. This was the first drug to be ever approved for cholangiocarcinoma. 
And this is now subsequently uh, received a favorable recommendation from the, Euro, from the European EMA. The overall survival in the 5202 trial was a very impressive 21.1 months uh, in cohort A and 6.7 months in cohort B and four months in cohort C. Quality of life was also studied in the 5202 trials and patients that had complete response or partial response to stable disease showed marginal changes from baseline in overall health care scores over time, indicating that despite the toxicities, the healthcare scores were preserved. Emotional functioning remained quite stable and similar in patients with complete response or partial response or stable disease, but declined in patients with progressive disease. The clinical activity of infogratinib in patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma was presented at the ASCO GI 2021 meeting. In this study, patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma that had progressed or were, or were intolerant to gemcitabine and cisplatin-based chemotherapy were enrolled. These patients were required to have FGFR gene rearrangements or fusions, and they were treated with infogratinib 125 milligrams daily for 21 days, with cycles repeated every 28 days. The primary endpoint of the trial was overall response rate with progression-free survival, disease control rate, overall survival being secondary endpoints. 100 patients, 108 patients were enrolled with an objective response rate of 23%. Uh, median time to response was 3.6 months with the disease control rate of 84%. The median duration of response was five months with the median progression-free survival of 7.3 months. The median overall survival in this trial was 12.2 months. Per investigator assessment, the objective response rate was 30.6% with the duration of response of six months. This table describes the activity of FGFR inhibitors and FGFR fusion positive cholangiocarcinoma. So infogratinib and pemigatinib have completed their pivotal phase two trials and have been presented. So have fudibatinib and darzantinib, although we are waiting for their data to be presented. Erdofetinib has also accrued very well. When you look at these results side by side, there's a common theme. The response rate is about 20 to 30%. Progression-free survival is about six to seven months. And the median overall survival seems to vary according to line of therapy. These very promising results have led to ongoing trials in the first line setting. So infogratinib is being investigated against gemcitabine and cisplatin in the first line phase three proof trial. And a similar trial is being conducted with pemigatinib in the form of a FIGHT 302 trial and fudibatinib in the Phoenix CCA3 trial. So these trials will now perhaps change the paradigm for FGFR fusion cholangiocarcinoma in the first line setting. These agents have a relatively similar toxicity profile. So the adverse events that are specific for FGFR signaling pathway inhibition, they include hyperphosphatemia, nail changes such as onycholysis, alopecia, mucosal dryness, and very important to follow are the ocular toxicities. They include asymptomatic retinal pigment epithelial detachment and central serous retinopathy. So I always tell patients to have a good ophthalmological evaluation every two to three months uh, while, on this, uh, while on this class of agents. The nonspecific uh, uh, toxicities that are related to FGFR pathway inhibition include fatigue, anorexia, arthralgia, and if there's FGFR4 activity, diarrhea, and if it's a non-specific inhibitors, the adverse events related to, for instance, VEGF inhibition, such as hypertension, proteinuria, thrombotic microangiopathy, and hypothyroidism. Let us move along to now other available and promising targets. These, of course, include immunotherapy with PD-1 inhibitors uh, for MSI and MMR uh, tumors now being approved by the FDA. This is a disease agnostic indication for uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So also with uh, TREC inhibitors for NTREC fusions. But what is emerging is other immunotherapies, 
such as checkpoint inhibitors for the non-MSI population. And I will present some information on arginase inhibitors that was presented in ASCO GI 2021. Other targets include PARP for DNA damage repair pathway, PI3 kinase AKT inhibitors, porcupine inhibitors, ALK, and other ADC molecules targeted specifically against HER2, for instance. Let us now look at the arginase inhibitor INCB0011588. This is a promising study agent that was combined with gemcitabine and cisplatin for the first line treatment of biliary tract cancer. Included patients were adults with good performance status, and the study agent was escalated from 50 to 75 to 100 milligrams BID, while the dose of gemcitabine and cisplatin were maintained stable. After the MTD was reached, the study dose was then included in a phase two expansion. These results as described at ASCO GI indicated an overall response rate of 24%. Stable disease occurred in 42% and the disease control rate was 66.7%. Now in comparison, if you look at the historical value with, values with gemcitabine and cisplatin, they're relatively similar with an overall response rate of 19%, 26.1% uh, of stable disease and 81.4% of disease control rate. So while this study indicated that the arginase inhibitor in combination with chemotherapy was well tolerated, it remains to be established if there was an, any additive value to, add, to this agent beyond just standard chemotherapy. Other promising targets for the development of biliary tract cancer include the ERB family, that is ERB1 and ERB2, the RAF and MEK pathways, and the VEGF receptor pathway. Let us first look at the phase two ROAR trial, which combined dabrafinib and trametinib, that is BRAF plus MEK inhibitor, a second line treatment for BRAF V600D mutated biliary tract cancer. As you can see in this very impressive waterfall plot, uh, most patients experienced either response or stability with this combination. The response rate was 22% by investigator assessment and 20% by independent review. But what was impressive was the duration of response and the progression-free survival. So progression-free survival in this, in, in this study was nine months and the median overall survival was 14 months in this heavily pretreated population. So the ERB B family pathway continues to be a promising target in cholangiocarcinoma and biliary tract cancer. In terms of ERB B1, although promising results were noted with cetuximab in combination with gemcitabine and cisplatin, confirmatory randomized two trials were however negative. Similar results were also seen with parentumab and erlotinib when combined with gemcitabine and oxaliplatin. Subgroup analysis did show some improvement in overall survival with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. However, the results in terms of overall survival were negative. HER2 or ERB2 continues to be a very promising strategy. Trastuzumab has been investigated in retrospective studies. Warlitinib, which is a pan-HER inhibitor, was investigated in combination with capecitabine in the second line setting and was shown to, and the results were negative, unfortunately, as compared with controls. ADCs or antibody uh, drug conjugates, such as trastuzumab deruxtecan, there's an ongoing phase two trial based and has indicated some promising results in the phase one expansion settings. So also neratinib, which is a pan, uh, her irreversible tyrosine kinase inhibitor. These data were presented for HER2 mutations uh, at ASCO GI recently. And ZW25, which is a bispecific antibody, had very impressive phase one and expansion data in biliary tract cancers. This study is now being investigated as a pivotal phase two trial in HER2 amplified biliary tract cancer. So in summary, unfortunately, most biliary tract cancers are detected quite late. In fact, only 30% are detected at an early or a resectable stage. These patients can be treated with resection and now adjuvant chemotherapy with capecitabine. The relapse rate, however, remains quite high 
and varying between 40 to 70 percent. Most patients now present with advanced disease, in fact, 70 percent do, and next generation sequencing and mutational profiling is now becoming standard. Gemcitabine and cisplatin remains the standard first line therapy, and next generation sequencing results are, are very useful to inform choices of second line therapy. For those without any actionable targets, Folfox remains a standard second line uh, treatment. But now increasingly in patients that have uh, promising targets, such as uh, with IDH1, evocidinib seems to have a promising signal. Certainly in terms of FGFR, pemigatinib is now approved. There are several other agents which, hope, which we hope will be approved as well in the FGFR space. I hope there's no patient now who has BRAF V600E uh, mutated cholangiocarcinoma or biliary tract cancer, who will not have access to dabrafidib and trametinib because this is certainly a promising strategy. In the disease agnostic basket, uh, MSI high and MMR case, uh, tumors uh, are effectively treated with pembrolizumab. And in case of NTREC fusions, these are effectively treated with entrectinib or larotrectinib. The unanswered question here is, now can targeted therapies move first line? Do we actually need chemotherapy at all? Or could we combine these targeted agents with chemotherapy in the first line setting? We hope to see those results soon. Thank you very much. I thank you for participating in this activity. I hope that you have found this activity informative and useful for your practice. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.